I am going to uh, dispense uh, with, the, uh, with the big bios and just give you the quick uh, you. precis of, uh, of who these folks are. On my left is Scott Faber, Environmental Working Group and many other places. Megan Stas is on his left uh, with the Grocery, Grocery Manufacturers Association. She's their Director of Sustainability. And then Bill Hohenstein of uh, USDA's Global Change Program Office. Uh, so. Uh, let's start with how, uh, bringing it back to the U.S., since we are here and I write for Scientific American, uh, how, how is U.S. agriculture moving to address climate change, if at all? Are we moving in the right direction, wrong direction? What kind of steps are we taking? Whoever wants to jump in first. And they all look at Bill. Sure, I can start. <laughs> Why not? I'm from the government. I'm here to help, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, first let me start by what USDA is doing. We have a, 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 a significant program focusing on climate change. Um, it's been around actually for over 20 years, um, starting with the Climate Change Prevention Act of 1990, which was one of the first acts of Congress on climate change. And it created the director of global change within USDA, which is now me, and I've been in that position for 12 years. Uh, we focus on research. We're increasingly focusing on our programmatic responsibilities. How do we integrate climate change into planning and operations? Our risk management operations, our conservation operations, our commodity operations, and what we do on forests as well. Now, when it comes to farmers, a lot of the adaptation, a lot of the understanding of climate change and, and planning for climate change is, is happening inherently. And there's been some very interesting research in the state of Iowa looking at how the climate has changed in Iowa, and the climate is changing, and, and we can see discernible effects of climate change within the U.S. Um, within Iowa, the changes are primarily changes in precipitation. A lot more water, a lot more water in the spring. What that has meant is a shorter planting, planting window, but more moisture available for crops and a longer growing season. And farmers are responding by uh, increasing tiling, increasing the drainage of their farms. There's a lot of tiling going in in Iowa. Um, uh, changing their planting dates and managing this shorter planting window that they now have in the spring. There, are in many, uh, uh, what's amazing is that, that, that with larger equipment and with, with, with new technology, the state of Iowa can be planted to corn in, in something around a week. And so even though we're facing some challenges within the state of Iowa in terms of agriculture because of these wet springs, farmers are adapting with larger equipment, new technology, and, and squeezing the crop into a shorter planting, planting window. Uh, so uh, as, as someone born and raised in Missouri, we've got to stop talking about Iowa. <laughs> oh, so, um, well, but, but please, Scott. Well, this, this is where the research was done. <laughs> well, and let me touch a little bit on uh, what farmers have been doing to help uh, sequester carbon and reduce emissions, because there's actually uh, a great 30-year uh, record now of success that is it's to some extent in jeopardy because of some of the decisions Congress will make later this year. Uh, and Bill can probably provide uh, a bit more detail on some of the success, but the, but the big picture is really since the, the early 1980s, we've seen dramatic changes in the way farmers till the soil. We've seen widespread adoption of tillage practices that sequester more carbon in the soil. Uh, just in the last uh, decade or so, we've seen a net increase in grasslands, uh, a shift from cropland to grasslands of about uh, 10 million acres. And uh, probably most impressively, we've met the, you know, I think uh, some of us, probably not you, Megan, are old enough to remember when. <laughs> that's more reflection on Bill and I. Five minutes. You are the industry representative. You are the industry representative. Oh. Uh, the, the, uh, the, Long, some of us are old enough to remember when the, the, net, the goal of no net loss of wetlands was a front page uh, issue. And really, we've met that goal, and, and now agriculture is uh, reporting or a, a net gain in wetlands. And a lot of those gains are the result of, of two uh, big policy levers, one of which is a huge investment over the last, uh, really now, 20 years in voluntary conservation programs where taxpayers share the cost of restoring grasslands and wetlands and forests and changing the way farmers uh, plant their fields. The other is a policy initiated in 1985 called conservation compliance. Um, very few people know about this, but in exchange for subsidies, farmers agreed in 1985 
to protect wetlands and grasslands and soil health. And as a result, primarily of, of that quid pro quo, or what we call the, the conservation compact, there's been a real sea change in agriculture in the last, last 30 years. Both of those big advances, funding for conservation and conservation compliance are in real jeopardy as Congress takes up the new Farm Bill. And you, you, many of you would be surprised to think there's legislation that will affect the climate that will be voted on this year. But the Farm Bill must be renewed. It expires in September. It must be renewed. And there are, 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 are critical decisions that could dramatically impact the extent to which farmers continue to have incentives to sequester carbon in the soil. The Farm Bill, a must pass that probably won't pass. But uh, before we uh, circle back to, to uh, discuss a little bit more about what you mentioned there, uh, let's hear the industry perspective. Well, sure. I mean, I think um, you know, market signals and, and market drivers in the supply chain are always tremendous uh, levers for change, right? And as, as we see farmers adopting new technologies that are better for the environment throughout the U.S. and around the world, our industry is really looking at ways to increase those inputs into our supply chain. So assuring farmers that working with farmers, helping them do the right things on their land, and then buying the end product is really only helping to um, further that shift towards a, a more environmentally friendly farming techniques. Do you have specific examples of how, you know, say the crafts of the world are, are reaching yeah. down the supply chain to uh, help someone in Missouri uh, <laughs> farm better? Or, 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 you know, wherever. But not Iowa. <laughs> not uh, Iowa. Uh, that's all I know is Iowa. What am I going to do? It's all it's Iowa. <laughs> the limestone yeah, caves. Limestone yes. Caves. Well, yeah. craft, uh, craft Foods actually... Um, one of their major uh, facilities is, happens to be situated next to a um, large section of naturally occurring limestone caves. And rather than building a whole new refrigeration facility on top of them, they actually, somebody, some clever person at Kraft actually said, hey, let's use them, right? Mm -hmm. So they now actually store most of the cheese that you get from Kraft has spent some of its life in one of these limestone caves in the, in the middle of the country. And it's dramatically reduced the amount of refrigeration dollars they have to spend, and obviously the, the carbon impacts on top of that. But in, in Missouri. It is in yes. Missouri. Yes. Yes, it yes. is. Yes. There you go. Yes, it's, it is. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But it sounds French. <laughs> yeah. Um, so to circle back to some of the uh, uh, um, uh, gains you were citing, you know, we, we heard earlier about how no-till good for carbon, maybe not so good for uh, biodiversity because of the increased uh, herbicide use, wetland refor and, and reforestation. Where, you know, the return is not the equivalent of what was lost except in acreage, um, potentially. At least that's the, uh, that, that's the science as I understand it. So can we, and, and from what I understand, those returns are now going back into production because of increased demand for, for yeah. corn for ethanol and feed and everything else yeah, that there, we want. There are, some, there are some extraordinarily powerful drivers that are going to um, upend or reverse a lot of the change that we've made. I, I've mentioned two, the two policy levers, but, but there are three other huge drivers that are going to affect the extent to which agriculture and ultimately the supply chains for food processors have an incentive to help us meet the challenges of climate change. One is, is uh, very, very high prices, which are driven in part by global demand. And there are about a billion of us who eat like you and me, and soon there'll be about three billion of us who eat like you and me, and nine billion of us overall. That's putting extraordinary pressure on the price of commodities. In combination with that just natural global demand, you have the, a rising demand for biofuels. It sounds like you've heard something about our renewable fuel standards. And <laughs> those, 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 those mandates are not just US mandates, they're global mandates. And, we're seeing around the globe countries turning to ethanol to uh, essentially water the scotch to, to reduce their uh, fuel prices by blending in, in some cases, depending on the day and the RBOB versus the rack price, a, a cheaper fuel than, than gasoline. And then the other big factor you have are some of the choices that Congress is about to make with regards to how we subsidize farmers. And, and uh, some uh, really troubling developments uh, within Congress. In particular, um, Congress is proposing to extend extraordinarily expensive insurance subsidies that essentially underwrite the decision to farm in places where farmers probably wouldn't otherwise farm marginal lands, uh, lands that have a lot of value for their uh, ability to filter runoff, sequester carbon, provide habitat for wildlife. And then to layer on top of those insurance subsidies 
a new shallow law, what's called what you would call a shallow loss entitlement program. A new, it's hard to imagine anyone's proposing new entitlement programs in 2012, but of course we're talking about agriculture. A new entitlement program that would essentially cover the deductible that farmers uh, have, would now pay on their insurance policy. So in combination, we would be paying about 60% of the premium that farmers pay on their insurance policies and pay a large share of the deductible associated with their shallow losses when they lose 5 or 10 or 15% of their average revenue. It's, and of course, when you, when you underwrite or essentially eliminate virtually all the risk of agriculture, uh, any farmer is going to make the, the sort of the rational choice. They're going to farm everywhere they possibly can because the returns will be uh, greater than the price of, of planting the field. So, Bill, you've been uh, uh, the direct. Well, you've been the director for 12 years. Right. How, you know, that's a that's a long tenure. Uh, how seriously are we taking uh, climate change in in both the Department of Agriculture, but also? Uh, the government writ large. I mean, you've seen some some pretty significant changes over the course of that 12 years. Uh, yes, and in fact, I, before becoming the director, I worked at EPA on climate change for oh, about man. a decade. So I go back to you know pre Rio. Um, All right. And back when we were going to do something. Certainly, the the, the work has evolved, and and I don't think that's quite fair because I think we certainly. I'm are, here are to be a provocateur. I can I can yeah. say very clearly we're you know we're well behind the research stage. I mean I think there's a you know there's an understanding not just that climate change is going to happen and the phenomena is real but that it's already happening. We're seeing it on the ground not just in Antarctica and the Arctic but we're also seeing it within the United States as well. And I think the perceptions of farmers is changing the perception is changing as well. And I think it, it reflects the U.S. population broadly. I spend a lot of time talking to farmers about climate change and. You, know, you will get the same diversity of views within the farm community that you do within the U.S. population. Um, we are working with our existing authorities and our existing programs um, within USDA, and, and that means primarily working through the conservation programs, the programs like the Environmental Quality Incentives Program, the Conservation Reserve Program, which was mentioned before, the Conservation Stewardship Program. And these programs you know, require funding. They're, they're basically supported through the Farm Bill through Congress. And uh, to, to, to get to Scott's point, we're going to need to be more and more efficient in terms of how we spend those conservation dollars. And so one of the things that we have underway within USDA is to try to quantify specifically these environmental benefits, the carbon sequestration benefits, the nitrogen reductions, the water quality improvements, the wetland benefits, so that when we're spending our conservation dollars, when we're working with farmers, that we're doing it efficiently and that we're getting the most bang for the buck. And that's going to be as important as anything, I think, moving forward um, over the next several years as budgets become increasingly more tight. Yeah. So it sounds like you are doing what, what Hans wants you to do, despite, uh, despite uh, charges. It, of, it's uh, sort of like the Nike you, model, right? Just do it. Yeah. We're, we're, you know, we're moving forward. And, and how long do you think it'll take for us to understand those carbon flows and... and well, we produce uh, an inventory of greenhouse gases and carbon sequestration each year for the United States. And so we can track the carbon flows within the soil. Um, there are uncertainties, certainly, in those measurements. And, and we're, we're actually doing something called the Quick Carbon Soil Carbon Assessment, where we're going out and actually sampling a lot of sites around the country right now. Um, that's needed globally as well. The, you know, we, despite the fact that we actually have pretty good numbers now within the United States, the uncertainties globally are much higher. Um, and so uh, measurement is certainly important, but then tying that back to the practices, you know, and, and making sure we're not just looking at current practices, but the practices that we think are going to be coming online 5, 10, 20 years down the road. Um, a lot of that um, uh, is in the area of nitrogen uh, and nutrient management. Um, there's a lot of exciting work on, on uh, new fertilizers that can reduce nitrous oxide emissions, that can spread fertilizer uh, availability out to plants and increase efficiency. Mm -hmm. uh, so we heard about waste in my, uh, in my last panel. Um, you know, something like 40% of food is wasted. We're growing all this great food and we're, we're throwing it away. That doesn't seem like good business. Uh, it's certainly not good for the environment and uh, 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 the government probably doesn't like it either. How, how do we go about addressing uh, waste? And, and I'd like to hear from all of you on this. Wow. 
I gave you that question. I'm so excited. <laughs> So my, I love way, I love trash. I'm sort of the queen of trash. I, uh, my, my office literally overlooks the dumpsters in the building behind us, and it's such a joyous thing because it makes me crazy. And we work in the food industry. We work in the consumer products industry, and it makes our industry crazy because it, just, it represents you know, everything you just said, right? It represents you know, missed opportunities for improved business efficiencies. It's not good for the environment, sending you know, organic material to a landfill. And of course, there's a tremendous food insecurity problem in this country, which we've heard a lot about today. So actually, the, the GMA, um, at the request of our board of directors, um, has launched a three-year project with the National Restaurant Association and the Food Marketing Institute, which is the trade association that represents retail grocery, to um, basically send less food to landfill and increase the amount of food that we are donating to the hungry in the United States. And um, we actually have um, Kai Robertson in the back from BSR is here with us today. Um, BSR helped us do a top line assessment at how much food right now is being thrown away in the United States. We know that EPA has some numbers. Um, we know that a lot of academic institutions had some numbers. But there were a lot of different methodologies out there. And what, what Kai and her team found for us is that we are essentially throwing away 215 meals per American per year in the United States. And to us and to our industry, that's unacceptable. And so recognizing we couldn't do this alone, we reached out to our retail partners and to the restaurant industry. And we are embarking on a, you know, two more years of, of solutions to find everything from policy to emerging solutions like new technologies on the horizon um, to communicating with stakeholders and educating consumers. To, to press on that a little bit, sure. a little bit more. I mean, some of the the food waste is about uh, um, uh, cultural cultural norms. Yep. Some of those cultural norms are are, are in fact uh, exacerbated by uh, sure. by some of your uh, participants. Sure. Um, yeah. How do we go about yeah. addressing that part of it? You know, I think it's like anything else. When you when you want to address waste, the first challenge is to produce less waste in the first place, right? So how can we um, find ways for consumers to, to reduce the amount of food waste that they're producing at home? How can we do that within all of our own manufacturing processes in the back of a retail store, et cetera? How can we do that through collaboration? And then it's finding solutions for the unavoidable waste, plate waste, um, institutional waste, things like that. You know, where, can it, where can it go where it'll have much more beneficial impact than a landfill? Because as I'm sure all of you know, um, Food waste in a landfill is actually significantly more impactful than packaging waste in a landfill because it creates methane, which is an extremely potent greenhouse gas. So for us, you know, there's just it's just a win-win left and right. If we don't eat it, the bacteria will, and they'll make the methane. Uh, <laughs> government, yeah. weigh in. Well, I'd like to <laughs> kind of talk a little bit about the international dimension. Of uh, please. This. Um, this is global. It is, and, and when you think about the, the footprint that agriculture has on climate change and the, the sources of emissions, you know, there are the direct emissions of methane and nitrous oxide from animal and cropping operations, but there's also the pressure that agriculture places on land use, and, mm -hmm. and deforestation is one of the significant sources of greenhouse gas emissions. About 18% of global emissions come from land conversion and deforestation. And so it's, it's if, the reason that Indonesia is number three on the list of, uh, of biggest emitters. That, that's right. We're not burning a lot of fossil fuels. Right. But if we can improve utilization, it's the same thing as increasing productivity. And so there, there are ways of meeting current and future food demand and other demands that we're going to have from, from the land. We can either be more extensive, we can put more land into production, which means more land conversion and more deforestation, or we can be more intensive. And the question is, how do we do that sustainably? Well, one of the practical ways to improve intensification is actually to improve utilization and, and work with, work, you know, focus on post-harvest loss, focus on loss in the production processes. You know, so we're actually getting more usable product out of the food that we produce. So what specifically is USDA doing to Well, that, to this is a, an important part of the Feed the Future initiative. You know, there was, I guess, a, a fair d amount of discussion about the, the, the administration's Feed the Future initiative. But a component of it has to deal with looking at post-harvest loss and, and processing in developing countries where it's an extremely important um, uh, issue. Well, and, and I'll just add that um, when you triage a landfill, 
uh, you know, the first thing you obviously would take out would be things that would have hazardous characteristics. The second thing you would try to take out would be these organic materials because of the methane emissions. So, so this, is, this is among the, the lowest of low-hanging fruit opportunities to really begin to tackle a significant source of greenhouse gas emissions in the U.S. And, and, and so the partnership that GMA has developed is important because it will help solve, uh, at least help uh, reduce emissions from one significant source. It's also um, an exciting way to, to deliver more fresh fruits and vegetables to low-income Americans. I, I know uh, Feeding America, other food banks have partnered with retailers to get more and more uh, fresh that consumers might not, might not buy because it doesn't look just right, but get more and more fresh to um, folks in food, through food, the Food the Food Bank Network. So there's a, there's a real opportunity there. But just to touch on something Bill said, you know, there's probably, and I, you would know, I'm sure, there's probably more food being lost between the field and the bin than between the plate and the landfill. There's so much lost post-harvest mm -hmm. that that is really a, a huge opportunity, in part because we are simply, we're facing a, a huge crisis in, in terms of the amount of land that continues to be lost, converted to cropland, uh, FAPRI, which in our little world is sort of the kind of final word on a lot of these issues. Um, estimates that there'll be, I think it's about 13% increase in global, in cropland globally in the next decade, with much of that coming in Brazil, Argentina, Mexico, Australia. So we're, because of this extraordinary uh, time of high prices, and because of just uh, uh, shortages, essentially, in or low levels of basic commodities, we're seeing lots and lots of land that's now in grass and forest being converted to cropland, having tremendous impact on the environment. So if there's some way to increase utilization at the front end and reduce waste at the back end, those would be two really significant ways to meet some of our big global climate challenges. Okay, so I'm going to throw it to the uh, audience. Have at them. We've got a great panel here. Uh, first out of the gate. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'm thinking that currently today about the budget, there are some suggestions that are across the board to cut the budget. And uh, some will say, say cut the subsidy for the oil. And some will suggest uh, maybe stop the nonsense grant, maybe by the uh, com Commerce Department, I mean, Chamber of Commerce or their affiliate in the local level to the federal, or maybe they divert the resources to benefit maybe a few. So in your opinion, what can be cut? And uh, how much percentage yeah. out of the exact figure you can go come up to? Get out the scissors. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll, I'll you know, I, I, few people could probably look across the entire budget and say cut here, cut there, cut here. But I'll, I'll give you a few good examples of things that would provide enormous savings and would really significantly help the environment. One would be dramatically reshaping how we subsidize crop and revenue insurance, the, the subsidies that we provide to farmers. I'll just take a second to explain this. It's just like your car insurance, or your homeowner's insurance. You pay a premium of, say, 1000 bucks for your car insurance. Under current law, the government is providing about 62% of that premium in a form of a subsidy to farmers. So, and when you add that up across a million policies, 262 million acres, it adds up to this year about $9 billion. Um, of that $9 billion, a, a significant share, about 15%, is even going to subsidize the premiums farmers pay on their insurance policies. About 15% of it goes to insurance agents and insurance companies to sell farmers those policies. And, and overall, over the next 10 years, that's that, that program of insurance subsidies is expected to cost you, the taxpayer, about $90 billion. Um, we've done some analysis, others have done some analysis that show that you could dramatically reduce the rate of subsidization and certainly reduce the amount we're giving to insurance companies and agents um, and help pay for other things that help farmers, help the environment, help rural communities, help promote uh, truly sustainable sources of renewable energy and provide a lot of money for deficit reduction as well. And what's very troubling for us uh, is that instead of cutting these subsidies, uh, the agriculture committees are proposing to make deep cuts to conservation programs and food stamps so that we can continue to provide truly unlimited, I mean, no limits, no means testing, no payments, truly unlimited subsidies to some of the most successful farm businesses in America. Anything to add to that? Really? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I said I was a provocateur. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, let me just, I mean, you're know, back. I, I mean, there are reasons to provide insurance to farmers and provide access to insurance. Now we can debate, you know, what the right level of that is. Um, but certainly farming is a risky business and there is a societal benefit to ensuring an adequate food supply. And that's sort of the underpinning behind the commodity programs and, and, and the, the support for, for, for insurance. You know, getting back to some of the trade-offs and, and the, the programs that, that we work directly with in terms of mitigation through the conservation programs, it, 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 we recognize that these are going to be really tight budget times and that, you know, if we're going to continue to support these kinds of programs that we're going to have to be able to document the benefits that they provide. Um, in addition, you know, we're looking at new innovative ways to provide conservation through emerging environmental markets where we can partner with the private sector recognizing that farms, when they do conservation activities, provide benefits to society. If we can internalize those benefits, if we can, if we can work with par partners in the private sector, we can supplement the, the resources that are available for conservation. And so those are the kinds of things that we're looking at within the department. You know, there, there's this broader discussion about you know, w what USDA should do, be doing in the next Farm Bill, but we're sort of more focused on our current authorities and what we're doing right now. Can I just get something? Of course. Mind? Now let's, let's have I'm the just, fight. I'm not going to put Bill on the spot. It's not his job <laughs> Again. to defend the uh, status quo. But you know, one of the things, and I, let me start by saying I, I completely agree and, and am pleased that USDA is, is doing more to document the benefits of these programs. There's a program within NRCS called CEAP or, CEAP or whatever we call it these days, CEAP, CEAP. that uh, is helping to kind of calculate all the benefits that we get in terms of cleaner water, cleaner air, wildlife habitat, carbon sequestration, very important. The thing that drives me to distraction is that we are not requiring the same scrutiny, the same proof of ROI of these farm subsidies. I mean, we are, we are in the last 15 years, between 1995 and 2010, we provided a quarter of a trillion dollars in subsidies to a handful of extraordinarily successful farm businesses. Keep in mind, like, virtually you know, only about a third of, of, of farmers are even eligible for these subsidies. And the, the largest 10% of those people who are eligible collect about three-fourths of the money. So where's the ROI? Where's the evidence that those dollars are ultimately needed for those very successful businesses, which, by the way, report average household income of more than $200,000 a year? Where's the ROI on those investments? And then the second thing that I just think USDA has an obligation to challenge is this nonsense about farm subsidies contributing to ultimately to lower food costs. I mean, the things that we largely subsidize in the U.S. don't go into the mouth of a gas tank or into the mouth of an animal, not into the mouth of anyone you're related to. And, and, so, I, or, and so largely, not exclusively, but largely. And, and I just, it just strikes me that if you re significantly reduce the rate of subsidization, I'm not, I'm not saying eliminate it entirely, but significantly reduced it, that you would see no impact whatsoever in planted acres, net cash returns, or ultimately the cost of those ingredients to the companies that actually turn that stuff into things that you all eat. So what, you know, it's just, I, it, I just thank you for this. You just saved me $140 on a couch somewhere. I just, <laughs> I just, I just, I hear this, we hear this all the time <coughs> in the fantasy land that is called agriculture policy. And, and it's just, it's wrong and it needs to be challenged. And I hope that USDA will bring because uh, I know there are terrific economists at OCE, I hope they will bring some real-world analysis to this question of what have taxpayers gotten for the quarter of a trillion dollars we have spent in terms of food prices, in terms of uh, preserving farms, and what are we about to get for the $120 billion we're about to spend over the next 10 years? Those are the questions that I think USD ought to be asking as well. Do you want a quick response, or do you want me to go back to questions? No, I think we can keep going. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I do want uh, to let other folks I have questions, but if you, want, uh, if you want the opportunity to respond, I'm, uh, you know. OK. No, I, think we uh, I saw Hans ha hand up. But remember, I'm going to hold you to the same standard as, uh, yes, as everybody sure. else. You know, we know prevention is better than cure. I think we heard this morning that if we have a resilient system, we'll be much less exposed to, again, the vagaries of wet weather, drought, or, or uh, floods. And it actually shown that organic farms here in the U.S. fare better than the conventional whenever there is an extreme weather situation. So, is, so why not invest those subsidies 
in the dirty word organic farming. Because so, so what are you waiting for to actually change this? We, we, we know it. So, so that's the question. No, no, what are we waiting for? Because I have a, a neighbor farmer who used to be deputy of the secretary, uh, Clinton. They started the, the, the Clinton, the Rominger family. Oh, yeah, really? All right, yeah, okay, so they started to grow organic tomatoes and, and, and rice, and they gave up because they can't compete with the uh, import from China, for example, in terms of tomatoes. So obviously, there need to be a help there to transition. So where is that money? Well, uh, USDA is playing an important role in, in promoting organic markets in the country. We're, we set the standards the, for what defines organic. Um, in addition, there's a tremendous amount we can learn from organic technologies that we can apply to conventional technologies. And so it's, it's not as simple as organic versus conventional. It's, it's what are the best practices that can provide uh, food, but at the same time do that sustainably and improve water and, and address greenhouse gases and, and reduce uh, input use. And so, you know, there, there are things that con conventional systems have adopted from organic agriculture over the last 20 years. You know, the, 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 the significant increase in conservation tillage is one example of that. The increased use of manure as a, a fertilizer is another example of that. And so, you know, organic agriculture and the demand for agriculture for organics is having an impact, not just on the organic farms in the country, but on all farms. Uh, Peter, yes, exactly. You know, there's it, it's so easy to try to look for that silver bullet, right? That, that if we do this, then everything will be fine. And you know, sustainability is, is, is not a silver bullet kind of issue. It's this, it's, you have to take a look at everything in a really you know, complete, holistic, global way. And I think- Don't you know, say silver buckshot. <laughs> silver buckshot. <laughs> oh, I'm gonna use that. <laughs> silver buckshot. Um, but you know, it's, it's, it's really a matter of- She and did I think, it anyway. I think, yeah. of course, because no, you told me yeah. to. Oh, you didn't tell I me. told you not oh, to. Sorry. That's all right. right. My listening skills. Yeah. Um, but you know, I think it's, it's what Bill was saying earlier. You know, it's all about our, our bang for our buck, right? And if we can, if we want to um, encourage farmers to convert to organic, that is certainly wonderful. And the market for organic produce is, and all organic materials, really, our food is just exploding throughout the U.S. and around the world. But, you know, but when we look at our global sourcing and what we can do to combat deforestation in the rainforest for materials like palm and soy, you know, I mean, it's, we, you know, it's, it's so easy to look for that one thing, um, but it, it's more complicated than that. And I think that we all have to take a step back and really look at what works and what gets us to where we want to be the fastest, and that's going to be multiple solutions at the same time. All we need to do is get the palm oil out of Girl Scout cookies. We'll be, we'll, we'll all be saved. Um, in the in the middle there, in the back, was the first first hand I saw, and then we'll come over here. I just want to go on record as supporting Girl Scout cookies. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I know Bill agrees with me. Thank you, uh, I'm Judge Schilling, and it's very interesting that uh, DOA is collecting. Um, you know, sorry, USDA is collecting much more information about greener, productive qualities, and that the supermarkets are trying to market more of that stuff, but I think it's very important to get that information to the consumer because it would offset some of the cheaper is better view if people understood that different um, products they were buying had contributed much more to greenhouse gas emissions or to pollution or other things, and this would involve labeling products that have GMO uh, production in them which I think would be very important, particularly since I gather EPA recently approved the use of a derivative of Agent Orange is there in a, corn uh, production is, is there a question that I would like here? to know about for sure. So how do we get that information out to the people effectively so that they can make rational decisions the way the free market tells us they will do it if they have the right information? So I want to know how we can get that information out, not just to groups like this, but to the consumers who are actually buying the products. To be slightly skeptical, it doesn't look like calorie counts uh, work too well. Uh, but uh, let's, uh, let's, let's answer that. Do you want to start? Or I, can. I, think I can start. <laughs> okay. I mean, so first of all, I, you know, consumers are smart and consumers care. And consumers ask us to produce the kinds of things that they want to eat. And I think you're, you're exactly right. You know, when you when you go into a grocery store and we've all been trained to look for that perfect orange or that, you know, that perfect apple. And yet, you know, it doesn't have to be unblemished in order for it to be perfectly nutritious and perfectly edible and all the rest. And I think consumers right now have an incredible amount of information 
at their fingertips. And I think, the, honestly, the biggest challenge for many consumers, many moms, is how to sort through all of the information that is available to them. And you know, we're, we're GMA and in the industry are really working hard on that. We've actually taken some of the, um, the most important nutrition facts from the back of the panel and moved them up to the front to volunteer effort throughout the industry. So you can see some of those key most important nutrition information in bigger letters, you know, bigger balance, right on the front of the package. You know, so, so again, so you, as a busy parent, busy consumer, you can go through the store quickly, find what you need, understand what's, what's important to you and your family, and make those decisions for yourself. Sure, and we have experience with, with labeling through, through the organics program. Um, and it is, it, it's not an endeavor to undertake lightly. You, you know, the organics system and the, 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 the development of regulations for organics was you know, a complicated endeavor. But it was, it was uh, initiated by a number of, of voluntary private sector activities where there were, you know, there, was, there were several attempts to actually look at you know, what defined organics. And there were several different systems for how to define organics out there. You know, we're seeing some of the same things on greenhouse gases, where um, there's an interest in, in uh, labeling or, or documenting the greenhouse gas profile of the commodities or the consumer products that are being produced. Um, a lot of interest in this in the private sector. The dairy industry, for example, um, has set a, a, an industry standard for reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 25% by 2020. They're, they're one of the only commodity groups to actually step out and make that kind of voluntary commitment. They're doing that in part because there's an interest from the retailers. In, in particular, some of the big retailers, when, when looking at the greenhouse gas profile of the commodities and the products that they were selling, said, we want to focus on milk and cheese and butter and try to see if we can actually improve the performance. And the dairy industry stepped up and is working with the re retailers on that. And they've, they're not only looking at, at, at documenting this, but they have a, an extensive research agenda that they've come to talk to us about where they're interested in digesters, improving the performance of uh, of reducing enteric fermentation from their livestock operations, uh, reducing the greenhouse gas emissions from the feed that's produced, their transportation systems, their cooling and storage systems. And they have pretty much an entire life cycle of where greenhouse gas emissions are emitted from the dairy industry and technologies and practices at each step that can reduce those emissions. The other Walmart effect. I, I really don't know yeah, anything we're, we, about that. We, we need to move on to some other questions here. She's been waiting patiently. Thank you. Um, I think all of you mentioned post-waste harvest and, or sorry, post-harvest waste. <laughs> um, and I was just wondering, though, about whether the GMA initiative is addressing the waste of the food that's not being harvested in the first place because of aesthetic reasons, and how big of the whole waste picture is that part of it? Aesthetics. On, on, farm, on farm food waste, like in the field, is, um, is definitely a big component of, of the overall food waste picture in the U.S. Our project right now is focusing on from manufacturer down to in restaurant consumption, which is a significant piece of the pie. It's about 44% of the, of the total pie. Um, but we also recognize that as manufacturers, there's a lot we can do on farm. But right now, that's not the immediate focus of our project. But there are a lot of really great efforts out there um, through NGOs and from, through some think tanks that are working on gleaning and how do we get that food to hungry people in, in the US. And also, um, what, what other value added sort of food products can that be made into, right? So it's not a, it's a bruised tomato. Can we turn it into canned tomatoes, right? So what, how do we, and how do we get that to market? Uh, yes, so one more question and then we'll try to wrap it up there in the middle. Yep. Thank you. I'm, I'm Leon Weintraub, University of Wisconsin. Uh, all during the day, we've heard discussion about better use of science, of cultivation practices, different reimbursement f for labor. One thing we haven't heard is, uh, is the uh, differences of land tenure, and particularly in areas outside of the United States. And we were talking a lot about that. You have a, a, a wide variety of either absentee landlords or uh, land held by villages and not really held by any individual for, in freehold. I'm wondering how much is, of, of, of a problem is that, and are we doing enough research into, into how we might be able to solve that problem? 
I, uh, I would encourage you to read Ed Carr's book. There's actually some, uh, some interesting stuff in there on that, which, uh, which shows that some of those communal ownership structures are actually good at promoting sustainability because no one particular farmer can kind of come in, mine the land, and move on. But anyway. Yeah, you know, it, to some extent, uh, <coughs> we have a similar dynamic in the US. About half of the, farm in the U farmland in the US is rented farmland. You have some uh, big um, investors moving into the land business, buying land, renting it to farmers. And as a result of that, uh, you don't wind up getting sort of durable, long-term uh, care of the land uh, as, because so much of it is just kind of trading hands from year to year. Um, one of the innovations that uh, started in the last Farm Bill and that we're trying to expand in this Farm Bill is what's called the Cooperative Conservation Partnership Initiative. And I'll just take a second to explain this. Uh, historically, we've always delivered these conservation payments to farm farmers a la carte. We you know, give you a check, and you a check, and you a check, and we wouldn't necessarily try to bring farmers together on a particular creek or a particular critter to try to uh, get long-lasting, durable solutions. So instead, what we're proposing to do, proposing to expand, is instead of giving grants and cost share payments and loans to individual farmers, to have farmers essentially come to USDA in groups along with their own money, a local partner, a foundation, a utility, what have you, the conservation district, and say, look, here's our plan to try to reduce nitrogen, phosphorus, sediment in this creek. It's a five-year plan. Here's what all of these different farmers are going to do. Here's our monitoring plan to show that we're going to meet our goals. And then deliver the, our conservation funding in that way. And it gets back to what Bill was saying about how do we make sure we're getting more ROI from these conservation programs we know we're going to, we, you know, we, we presume, because we're optimistic, that there won't be cuts to these programs, although some in Congress are trying their best to make them. How do we make sure that the $30 billion, more or less, that we'll spend over the next five years is being leveraged with other dollars and is actually producing long-term, sustainable, durable results so that we don't sort of lose those benefits when the land changes hands five years from now? So we're almost out of time. I want to ask one last question of, of the panelists. We're up here. Uh, yeah. At, a, at a, an event called Feeding the World While the Earth Cooks. We haven't uh, focused that much on uh, climate change. I'm going to ask each of you to kind of give your one big fix or uh, uh, idea for both reducing the greenhouse gas emissions. I mean, agriculture is, let's face it, yeah. potentially the biggest uh, uh, emitter of greenhouse gases. We do a lot with cars. We're trying to do a lot with power plants. We, we seem to be doing much less in agriculture. So what's the one big fix uh, that, that you would suggest? Only one. Uh, Only one. Silver bullet. Silver, Silver buckshot. Buck <laughs> Silver buckshot. Uh, well, I'm going to take two. So the first right. one's going oh, <laughs> so, to So the first one funny. is um, that we, you know, there are enormous potential uh, relatively inexpensive <coughs> gains to be made in how we use nitrogen globally. And, um, and so in terms of how much is applied, new techno technological innovation. So we could dramatically reduce the amount of nitrogen that we use without, and simultaneously increase yield. So that, that would be a kind of a no-brainer. Um, I can't remember the number, but it's still a huge number of farmers are not doing sort of basic nutrient management just in the US. So you can imagine what's happening globally. Um, and we the, see that in the Gulf of Mexico. Absolutely. And the second would be, I, I think we really have to um, very quickly uh, reevaluate and reverse course on our, our global commitment to ethanol. I mean, there, and, and in part because it's just putting our food security, our environment, environmental security, and our energy security on a, an awful collision course. I mean, if, if, if we live in a world where the 10% of the globe's fuel supply is ethanol, it's lights out. I mean, start packing your bags and looking for a new, new planet. There's no way, despite the innovation of our farmers and the people who sell them uh, you know, inputs, there's no way we could possibly produce enough food in, a, in an E10 world. And so I think we very quickly have to figure out whether we've made a, you know, really a, a tragic global policy mistake and instead look for how do we get the truly sustainable second generation fuels to commercial, commercial, the commercial marketplace quickly. Because um, the genie's out of the bottle. Um, we've reached saturation point in, in the US. We're, 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 we, now we, we're going to exp we've exported more than a billion gallons of ethanol this year to of all places, the Middle East and Saudi Arabia uh, and, and, and Brazil. And so it's just, you know, it's, it's a terrifying picture if we don't begin to really see these second generation fuels get to the market. So uh, we already ask our lands to produce food, 
feed and fiber. Now we're going to add the fourth F uh, yeah. fuel, and that's going to that's going to uh, put yeah, take the wheels off. You've the bus. probably heard this 40, already. Forty percent of our corn supply in the U.S. is going into your gas tank, and and now not just your gas tank, but to some Emir's gas tank in in the in the United Arab Emirates. So it's you know it's it's just and it's going to grow as these global markets grow, and, and, and partly in response to higher and higher oil prices. Yeah. You know, I think it's about efficiency. You know, the, the essence of sustainability is doing more with less, right? And we're going to have to keep doing that. And, and certainly business is really good at finding efficiencies wherever we can and getting the most bang for our buck. And I think that's encouraging the conversion of supply chains into sustainable supply chains. And I think that is looking at how we can just produce less waste. And that's energy waste, that's water waste, that's food waste. But, you know, it, encouraging efficiencies and as much as possible, I think, is, is one of our silver buckshot solutions. <laughs> uh, 12 years. Uh, <laughs> what, what have you learned? I will take a, a second of my time to, sure. to, to say that I'm, I don't necessarily share the concerns about ethanol. I think ethanol can play an important role in, in mitigating greenhouse gas emissions, including conventional ethanol. And I think there are ways of producing ethanol that that aren't going to contribute to land use change that we can do so in the context of everything else that we need to produce from land. Good, our the second thing, disagreement. The, the thing that keeps me up at night is not so much on the mitigation side, although I think agriculture can play an important role in, in mitigating greenhouse gas emissions. It's the effects of climate change on agriculture. And again, not so much in the United States, but globally, where the, the capacity, there was a discussion about resilience. The, the resilience of farmers and the capacity to adapt to climate change is much more limited in developing countries. And there, the key technologies and practices are better access to information, you know, things like FuseNet, where we're providing drought early warning systems, where we're giving farmers access to climate information in advance of the events. Better access to seed and technology so they can improve produ production and reduce potentially the footprint that agriculture has. And then finally, better access to water management. Water management technologies are going to be critical in developing countries. Yeah, uh, as a final point, uh, you mentioned water. Do we have uh, enough water to do what we want to do? Do we have enough land to do what we want to do? Uh, final, final thoughts on that. Well, I, you know, I, I think some of you probably are familiar with a report, I can't remember the author, called Water 2030. It was sort of looking at this question of our global water budget. Maybe, Bill, you remember who did that. Um, I don't. I'll anyhow, it, you know, clearly Google. we are fair. Go, if someone's Googling it. <laughs> uh, you know, clearly, we are going to be stretching our freshwater supplies sort of past the point where we will have enough to go around, to put it simply, fairly in, in our lifetimes. And that's a, that's a real challenge. The yeah. variability caused by climate change is going to make those problems even worse. And then I think where Bill and I probably disagree uh, is on this whole land question. And because I think certainly um, there are some kinds of biofuels that reduce greenhouse gas emissions relative to gasoline. Um, but if you have to, if you create enormous amounts of demand for those feedstocks, um, they have to be grown somewhere. Yep. We're, we're, we're going to get the music in a second, so let me let them uh, respond as well, just very quickly if you want to. Well, I, again, I think um, productivity improvements are in, in some ways a way out of this. I think, you know, with improvements in product productivity, and there are tremendous, there's tremendous potential for that, especially in developing countries, that, that we can increase food supply and, and reduce overall pressure on, on, uh, on, mm -hmm. on food and feed yeah. and so fuel. Yeah. Okay. I mean, it's, it's yeah. an incredibly precious resource. And it's, it's important to everything that we do. It's important to my industry. It's important to how we live. And you know, we, need to, we need to think about it that way. And I think you know, Unilever's turn off the tap campaign, the work that PepsiCo has done in India, the work that Coca-Cola is doing, sharing their data with the World Resources Institute. I mean, it's a collaboration and, and efficiency is you know, one of our solutions. 45 minutes, not enough time to uh, uh, spend on this uh, topic, but uh, that's what we had. And uh, I'd like you to join me in thanking my wonderful panelists. Thank you.